Oh, there we go. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, so I think we're small and smaller than usual in number today, but most of you obviously got the new Zoom. This will be the last time that it'll be a new Zoom. I made it for the whole rest of the semester. So okay. this will be the Zoom that you'll tune in throughout the rest of the semester. Okay? All right, so I think I have everybody who's here. Um, oh, Sefi, yay. All right, we're growing in number. So um, hopefully you sent me your exams. They were due by right now. So I checked before class started and I had most of them. So hopefully the rest of them came in. So we left off talking about 6.1 and we have a few theorems still to prove on 6.1 and then you, or six, let's see, yeah. And then we'll go on to the next section. So, so on 6.1, we left off where we had shown that the, in a circle, congruent chords have congruent minor arcs and congruent, uh, uh, let's see, congruent chords have congruent minor arcs and congruent arcs have congruent chords. So that was the last thing we proved, Courtney, correct? Was yeah. about the congruent chords? I think so, yeah. Theorem okay. 6.1.5. Okay. And 6.1.6 .6 is going to work in a similar fashion. We talked about that. Yeah. Just going in the reverse direction. Okay, so we're talking about theorem 6.1.7. So in theorem 6.1.7, what we're looking at is chords that are the same distance from the center of a circle are congruent. So if we have a chord here, and a chord here, if they are the same distance, so we'll have chord A, B, C, D, and we'll have point M and point N, and here's O, our center. So what we're asked to prove in this, we're told that chords that are the same distance from the center of a circle are congruent. So we're asked to prove AB is congruent to CD. Everybody good with that? Question on that? Okay. And we're given that OM is congruent to ON. Remember, distance implies that these are perpendicular. Everybody agree with that when we talk about distance from a point to a line, we're talking about drawing the line that's perpendicular to that. And we proved that that's the shortest length. So right. I'm going to go ahead and construct OB and OC. Now 
Now we're going to give an outline of the proof. Remember what we're trying to show is that A, B, and C, D are congruent. And so since we talked about the fact that when we do the distance, it's always going to be perpendicular. What do we know about a perpendicular radius to a chord? What does that do to the chord? It bisects it. It bisects it. So we know that CN is congruent to ND. So we know that CN is congruent to ND, and we know that AM is congruent to MB. Now, we have what kind of triangles are Triangle B O M and triangle C O N. Montana, what kind of triangles are these? Right triangles? Mm -hmm. So can we say anything about these two triangles knowing that they're right triangles? Catherine. They are similar. Similar? Or can we go even further? Congruent. So these triangles are congruent by what rule? HL? Yes. We know that OB is congruent to OC. Courtney, why, why are OB and OC congruent? OB and OC uh, by CPCTC. No, we are, we're, we're trying to establish this. We're giving the reasons that this part is true. So oh. why do we know that OB is congruent to OC? Um, what are OB and OC? Radius. And what do we know about radii? Oh, um, they're all congruent. Okay. Alrighty. And the other thing that we were given was that OM is congruent to ON. So, now, Courtney, you wanted to use by CP congruent, corresponding parts of congruent triangles or congruent. What can you conclude? That AB is congruent to CD. Well, eventually. We're okay. not quite there yet. What okay. can we, what's the first step? Um, MB. MB is congruent to NC? Yes. Okay. And by transitivity, we can say then that, that, um, oh, Courtney, I was going to call on someone else, but if you want to step in, I'll, I won't stop you. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> got so excited. So we can replace, right? And yeah. See, 
by ND? Yes. And that's going to be congruent to AM? Yep. And congruence implies equal, implies congruence. We can use addition. So by addition of segments, we have that AB is congruent to CD. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Question before we go on. Okay, so theorem 6.1.8 I'm going to be really economical on my erasing. What changes is that what we're asked to prove is that the distance of congruent chords from the center is the same. Now, this one is a lot easier. Why is this easier? Well, we're still going to construct those. And the bisection implies something even stronger. What do we know if we have two congruent segments? What does our theorem tell us? If we have a bisection in two congruent segments, what kind of seg how many of what kind of segments are formed? Or congruent segments. Okay. So here what's going to happen instead of having the OM and ON being congruent. We're going to have that BM is congruent to CN. And this time, so this is a much shorter proof. By corresponding parts of congruent triangles, we automatically get the OM is congruent to ON. And so we're done. So this direction is much easier to prove than the other direction. I have a question about yes. a potential alternate approach. Okay. Which would be if we know that AB is congruent to CD and we know that all radii are congruent, then we have two tri congruent triangles by side, side, side. And I believe we have a theorem that says that if you have congruent triangles, then their altitudes are congruent. That would be another way of going about it. 
okay, so there's not any kind of weird definition of altitude that says we can't use those perpendicular lines as altitudes? Well, we, you'd have to go one step further, right? So in other words, you'd have the altitudes are um, congruent, and then you'd have to say that the altitudes represent the distances. So you'd have a little bit, you'd have a little bit more explaining that that altitude represents the distance. So you'd have to okay. clarify that. But yes, you could do that, but you'd, ha you'd have that extra clarification in there. Okay. Yeah, less, explain less explaining is better. <laughs> <laughs> so here, this, this is what we were talking about. And so um, because these were the distances in there, you're going for the altitude, you're claiming the altitudes are the same, and then you have to explain that those represent the distances, okay? okay. All right, so an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. This is theorem 6.1.9. So we're looking at a circle and we're looking at a semicircle. I'm going to move C. So we're trying to prove the measure of angle A C B is 90 degrees. Now what we haven't proven, but after this theorem we'll go ahead because we're doing as a lemma, the measure of arc a, B plus the measure of arc B, C, A is 360. So notice that in indicating the, if we just say A, B and B, A, order doesn't matter, but now I'm indicating here that AB is this first arc, BCA is the other arc. Those two arcs, we do have that if we add up all the arcs of a circle, we get 360 degrees. So we have a statement about that. We also know that all semicircles are what? Congruent in the same circle, right? So that means their measure is going to be the same. So we can do this. And from henceforth, we know the measure of a semicircle is what? 180. 180. So with that lemma, what happens to the measure of angle ACD. It's half of it because we have a theorem that says that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so the measure of the inscribed angle is half the measure of the arc. So it just really falls right out. I'm not yeah. going to write it because I've run out of room. But you guys can all write that the measure of angle ACB is equal to one half the measure of arc AB 
which equals one half of 180, which equals 90 degrees. Everybody okay with that final step? Question on that? No, it looks good. Okay. And if two inscribed angles intersect the same arc, then these angles are congruent. So for theorem So we have A, D, B, and we also have A, C, B. We're supposed to prove angle A, C, B is congruent to angle a, D, B, given intercept same arc. So, is this going to be a short proof or a long proof? Montana, what do you think? Short. OK. So By inscribed angle theorem, we know that the measure of angle A C B equals one half the measure of the arc A B, which equals the measure of angle A D B. So both these angles are one half the measure of arc AB. So we drop out the middle by transitivity. We get the measures are the same. And what's true about equality implies what? Congruence. The congruence. Do I need to write down those steps or everybody good? I'm good. Good? All right, unmute yourselves and say good or no good. 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 Okay. All right, so we're all good. So now we get to go to section 6.2. In section 6.2, we are looking at angle measures in the circle. Now, our first definition is what does it mean for a line to be tangent to a circle? So we're stepping away from calculus. Because in calculus, does a tangent line to a curve 
have to intersect it only once. There should be a resounding what? No. But a tangent line to a circle intersects the circle how many times? Once. Once at the point of tangency. So a tangent is a line that intersects a circle at exactly one point. The point of intersection is the point of tangency. A secant is a line or segment or ray that intersects a circle at exactly two points. Now, when we talk about a polygon is inscribed in a circle, that means that all the vertices are points on the circle and its sides are chords of the circle. Equivalently, the circle is said to be circumscribed about the polygon and the polygon inscribed in a circle is further described as a cyclic polygon. Okay, so there on 6.2.1, says that suppose we have a circle and we have a quadrilateral inscribed. Sefi, what are we asked to prove in theorem 6.2.1? The opposite angles are supplementary. So that means that the measure of, we only have to do it for one set because the proof would go the same. The measure of angle A plus the measure of angle C is going to equal 180 degrees given the quadrilateral is inscribed in the circle. So using the same thing that we said before, the measure of arc BCD plus the measure of arc DAB is equal to 360 degrees. That's because of the measure of all the arcs, the sum of the measure of all the arcs of a circle are equal to 360 degrees. Then if we multiply this whole expression through by one half, Keep wanting to put function for measure. That's going to equal 180. Ting Ting, what can we replace the one half the measure of our BCD with? What angle can we say 
as that measure? Uh, angle A. Okay. And Catherine, what can we replace one half the measure of arc DAB with? Angle C. And we're done. Question on that before we go on. Makes sense to everybody. Yeah. All right, so so we also have circumscribed, and that says that the circle, if all the sides of the polygon are line segments tangent to the circle, the circle is said to be inscribed in the polygon. Okay, now there's a summary of all the rest of the theorems in pictures down at the bottom of this particular of 6.2. So if you go to the bottom of section 6.2 on your sheet, you'll see that there's a summary of all the things we're saying about the relationships of angles and arcs. And so when we look at the next theorem, it's going to tell us something about one of those pictures that we have down at the bottom of 6.2. So theorem 6.2.2 says that the measure of an angle formed by two chords that intersect within a circle is one half the sum of the measure of the arcs intercepted by the angle and the vertical angle. Okay. So, so we have two chords that intersect. And the claim is that this angle is equal to the sum of the two arcs. Now, in the picture below, and it's the last one shown on the first row, is the picture that represents 6.2.2. And so we want to prove that the measure of angle one is equal to one half K degrees plus J degrees. So, Let's construct chord DB. We'll call that point where they intersect P. So, 
if we look at triangle DPD, so that's this triangle here. Melinda, what kind of angle is angle one to triangle DPB? It's an exterior angle. So by the exterior angle theorem, what can we say about the measure of angle one? And I'll make it easy. I'll put a two and a three here. So we don't have to write alphabet soup out. So what's true about measure of angle one? The measure of angle one is equal to the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three. Everybody good with that? Okay, so Guy, where are we headed with this? Uh, measurement of angle 2 equals half of J. Okay. Same with K, so measurement of angle 3 is half of K. So we substitute the whole thing and we're done. <laughs> okay. So by inscribed angle theorem, We have the measure of angle two is equal to one half of J degrees and the measure of angle three is equal to one half K degrees. By substitution and commutative, Prop. We have the measure of angle one equals one half K degrees or J degrees plus, oh, we're okay. K degrees plus J degrees with our commutative. Okay. All right. Question on that. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, some of the other theorems we're going to be, have to be more careful about because here we didn't have to worry about one of these being a diameter. We just used the exterior angle theorem. So when we meet again on Wednesday, what we will be doing is we'll go ahead and we will look at some of the theorems from the aspect that there may be three different ways that things are happening, just like we did on one of our previous theorems where we had to look at, suppose that one of the sides was the diameter, the diameter was in the interior of the angle, or the diameter was in the exterior of the angle. So we're going to do, be doing the same thing with some of our other theorems that we're going to prove in this section. Okay. So that's it for today. This is a good place to end. And I will grade your exams and I'll post your exam scores. I'll create a place in the um, grade book for your exam scores and they'll be posted before class on Wednesday. Okay, question on that. Sounds good. All right. I Have guess a great evening. You've got homework due tomorrow night on 6.1, I think. There's a new homework assignment out there for you guys. So, okay. Sounds good. All right. Have a nice evening, everyone.
Hi. If for yeah. some reason you don't have someone's uh, exam, you'll let us know if we need to email it again or something. Uh, yes, okay. exactly. Uh, Melinda, I have yours. Okay, I good. I saw your name pop up. Just good. as between my two classes, I saw your name. So you're good. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. Have a nice evening. You too. Thank you.